close your eyes, watch your breath. Watch your breath from the inside. In other words, feel the breath as it goes through the body. We'll use the word breath here. It's not just the air coming in and out. It's a sensation of energy in the body. It's part of the wind element in the body. If you pay careful attention, you'd be surprised at how it fills the whole body or how it can fill the whole body. But for the time being, focus on the parts where it's easiest to have that sensation that now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. Notice if it's comfortable. You can start with some long breathing. If long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it doesn't feel good, you can change. You're looking into the possibilities that the breath has for you, and creating a sense of well-being right here. We have lots of possibilities here, lots of potentials, both in the body and in the mind. And our problem is that we don't take advantage of them. That we already have the quality of mindfulness to some extent, the ability to keep some things in mind. And we're sometimes alert to what we're doing. These are potentials, but you want to develop the potentials because they can take you far. That's what the news of the Buddha's awakening is. That you don't have to depend on anyone else outside to come and awaken you or enlighten you. You can wake yourself up from inside by developing the qualities you've got. For most of us, mindfulness is not that impressive. Alertness is not that impressive. But if you really work on them, you find that they make a big change in your mind. If you're mindful about the right things and you're continually mindful, and when you're alert to what you're doing right now, like right now you're focusing on the breath, so you want to make sure you do it well. That's a third quality, atapa, ardency. You really try to do this well. And in doing it well, you find that you develop the other qualities too. And this spreads out to other good qualities throughout the mind. So when we say that we have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, this is how it plays out. Because conviction means, one, who you're convinced is telling the truth, two, what are the truths they're telling you, and then three, what do you do as a result? Only then can you say that you're really convinced. If you hear something and it sounds nice, the person seems reliable, but you don't act on it, that's not really conviction. With conviction, you take the message, you look at the person, they seem reliable, the message seems good, and then you actually test it in your own practice. And that's what the Buddha asked. He didn't say that you had to believe everything he said 100% beforehand, but he said, but do take it on as a working hypothesis. If you focus on training your mind, what are the results going to be? And if you give him a fair test, you find that he was right that it is possible by developing potentials that you have within you to go really far, to find a happiness that is not subject to aging, illness, or death. That's quite an audacious claim that he's making. But he had tested it not enough. He tested himself. So he was confident that he could make that claim, and that other people following his advice would also get the same results. And we have many, many cases of people who have. So that's the benefit of having this kind of faith, this kind of conviction. That it can lead you someplace through developing your own qualities. Where there is no sorrow, there is no grief, there is no aging, illness, or death. That's the big issue in life. Now that we're born, we're facing these things. And how can we face them without suffering? That's the skill that the Buddha taught. You might say it's an urgent skill, one that we should develop right away. There's that famous story of the monk who came to see the Buddha one time and said, Is the universe finite? Is it infinite? Is it eternal? Is it not eternal? A whole list of questions of that sort. And the Buddha refused to answer the questions. He said, These are not conducive to putting an end to suffering. The monk said, Well, if you don't answer them, I'm going to leave. And the Buddha said, Well, I never made any promise I was going to answer those questions. And then he gave the example of the man shot with an arrow. He comes to see the doctor, and the doctor's getting ready to pull the arrow out. And the man says, no, wait, before you pull the arrow out, I have to know who shot the arrow, what clan he was from, 
what kind of wood the arrow was made out of, what kind of feathers. And if you had to track down all that information before you pulled the arrow out, the man would die. The implication of this is that we've all been shot by an arrow. We've got to get it out, otherwise we're just going to keep on suffering again and again and again. So learn to make sure that your mind is not consumed by petty issues, issues that would try to find the name of the feather or name of the wood. And focus on the issues that would help lead to an end of suffering, like how you can develop more mindfulness, how you can develop more alertness, how you can develop the potentials you've got within you, both in body and in mind. When you do that, there's hope for your cure.